negative into a positive. And Joseph has done that more than once as we look at his life. And I think today's message is so powerful because as we reflect back on our past, to be able to see God's hand, maybe even in a rejection, a demotion, a closed door, a stop sign, although we didn't understand it at the moment and it seemed like a defeat, it seemed like a dead end, we can look back and see that that closed door is what opened the door to something better. That dead end street is what opened up an opportunity that we wouldn't have had if that door didn't close. I've shared bits and pieces about my life with you in my past, but five years ago, I went to Kyrgyzstan. I was deployed as part of the Afghanistan war. And I left the church where I was a senior pastor. I felt in good hands and in good status. When I came back after being deployed six months, the church decided that they wanted the associate pastor to be the senior pastor more than they wanted me. And I was begged to resign from that church at a little restaurant in Loomis, California, and I'll never forget it. And when that happened, I thought that was the end of the world for me. Where am I gonna live? What am I gonna do? What does this mean about my vocation? Where will I find another church? Do I even wanna find another church after the rejection and the pain that went along with what I experienced? And then I was in Oakdale, California. Talisa and I were just dating, not married yet. And I got a phone call when I was living in my little one bedroom apartment in Oakdale, California, a fellow chaplain friend said, hey Donnie, have you ever thought about doing a reconnaissance mission with a, a, an air guard base in Reno, Nevada? And I would have never dreamed what that opportunity opened up to be. But sometimes I go on a very familiar rant with my wife talking about the pain of that rejection from five years ago. And you know what she reminds me of? She reminds me of this, Donnie, if you wouldn't have been rejected then, we wouldn't be married now. And now you have a wife that loves you and sometimes likes you. <laughs> and if that church job door didn't close, the door would have never opened to the full-time military position that you have that, that has even greater opportunities than you ever had being a pastor in Auburn, California. And when you had that church job, you lived in a little one-bedroom apartment in California. Now, we have our own home in Cold Springs, Nevada with 17 chickens. <laughs> but the biggest thing of all, Donnie, is we have a beautiful, healthy, miracle baby that we wouldn't have if you didn't get rejected. And when she was done talking to me, when she gets done talking to me, I never feel so good about being rejected as I do when that kind of conversation is over. But she's right. If you look at your life like Joseph did, Joseph looked back at his brothers who were feeling guilty and ashamed for what they had done to him. And Joseph said, it's all right. God used that negative and turned it into a positive. And what you're seeing now, my brothers, is the result of God's work. You thought you were in control. You weren't in control. God's hand was in this the whole time. And all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and live according to his purpose. Everybody say with me, all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord and live according to his purpose. So Joseph takes this negative that we hear in this story and he flips it into a positive. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today. And I want you to be inspired to do that with anything that happens in your life. What may seem like a dead end is just opening up options for something better. And what may seem like rejection is God's way of moving you up and out and beyond and into something better and bigger and more useful and more, more fulfilling. And what may seem hurtful at the moment, if you let God work in your life, it's going to produce bounty and prosper and blessing beyond what you could ever measure if you just let God work in that situation. So today we're gonna to focus especially on the area of forgiveness and what Joseph offered to his brothers. As preliminary remarks today, I want us to look at this little diagram up here. This is 
what I believe happens in the area of forgiveness. First of all, forgiveness is a vertical issue between us and God. And every Sunday, we take communion, or nearly every Sunday, and we will renew that forgiveness. And we will again confess any sins that we might have. And we will, we will freely go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. And he's faithful. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's necessary. That brings relief. It brings freedom. It, it takes away guilt. It takes pressure off of our backs just to know that we've, we've given, it all, given it all to the Lord. And Lord, here it is. Here's my sin. Here's me. Here's my problems. Here's my issues. Here's my burdens. And it is a relief. Amen? Amen. And that's, that's a beautiful day and a beautiful moment when we're able to just take our lives and give it to God and let Him forgive and cleanse and heal. But that's only part of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is also as horizontal as it is vertical. Horizontal. Horizon. Ontal. That's how I have to figure out how to spell words. I have to break it down. Horizontal. And what I mean is, forgiveness is a two-sided coin in that when we receive His forgiveness, we then extend forgiveness to other people. And to short-circuit this of forgiving others will be to short-circuit God's forgiveness toward us. In other words, there's no such thing as saying, God, I give you my sin. Thank you for all of your forgiveness, but I'm going to withhold forgiveness from this person over here. Forgiveness is vertical and it's horizontal. That's why the scripture says to forgive as you have been forgiven. forgiven. We forgive as we have been forgiven. And what happens is when we withhold forgiveness from our offender, we can't appreciate the full forgiveness from our Heavenly Father. Full forgiveness this way allows us to have full forgiveness. This way it's vertical and it's horizontal. We feel really good about our relationship with God when we go to Him with our sins. And when we're able to forgive our offender, guess what that opens up for us? When we're able to accomplish forgiveness this way and with people who have offended us. Offended us. Then you can forgive yourself. And we can't get very far in this life until this happens too. That's the third part of the equation of forgiveness. It is, ver it is vertical. It is horizontal. But that opens the door to us then being able to say, you know, I don't have to beat myself up anymore. There's just something about the freedom that comes when we forgive this way and this way where we get to enjoy that for ourselves and we realize that yeah we fall short yes we're human yes we've made mistakes yes i shouldn't have blew up when i blew up i shouldn't have reacted like i reacted i shouldn't have made that decision but it's okay and we can we can forgive ourselves but we really can't forgive ourselves truly unless we also have forgiveness working this way and this way I want you to see something interesting in this passage with that diagram in the background. But first, how many of us do you think struggle with being able to forgive ourselves? Raise your hand if you've ever struggled with that. Yeah. All right. Almost all there. Why do you think we struggle with that so much? I gave you a couple hints, but why do you think we struggle with that so much? Not turning your will over to God. Staying in your own will. Okay. Not believing, having faith. Yep. Good. Not not allowing God to work in us, but holding on to it. Being in control of everything we want. <laughs> I think the enemy loves it when we don't forgive ourselves. But he's constantly like reminding you inside your head, you know, what you know, what happened, what that person did to you. So it's just that constant battle. Yeah. We have sin in our life, we hold up that sin. We don't feel worthy to be to forgive ourselves because we have to overcome that sin ourselves. We can't let God do it sometimes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, when we have a known sin that we are practicing on small or large level, 
You don't get to benefit from the peace and joy of being able to forgive ourselves because we haven't, we haven't taken care of this yet. Until we take care of this, we can't enjoy peace. And our peace will always be limited until we're able to accomplish this with those who have hurt us as well. And then we get the full, wow, forgiveness this way, forgiveness this way. Now that doesn't mean that if you forgive your offender, you're still not going to feel pain sometimes toward them. And hurt feelings aren't going to come up in your mind because you're an emotional being. And part of that being an emotional being is memory. God did not design you to be able to forget painful times in your life. You will never forget those. Don't even pray about forgetting those. Those are in your life for a purpose. But we can adjust to them. We can deal with them. We can find grace in them. But the human mind is not designed to forgive unless you're my dad or my mom and they say they forget things all the time, but that's not on purpose. That's just because they forgot it because they said they're getting old. So maybe when we get older, it is a blessing when we forget things. Watch this story today. Let's take this little diagram and and figure out how it works. Let's begin with this whole thing of Joseph identifies himself. And read this one more time for us, Sandra. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there, were, so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Now remember, the brothers didn't know this was Joseph. This whole time, Joseph knew it was them. And here they are in this reunion opportunity. And for the first time, Joseph lets down his hair, so to speak. And he reveals himself to his brothers. And he, he clears everybody out of the room. Does everybody leave? And it was just him and his brothers. Eleven of them. And he wept, Joseph wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. You talked about the love. Now here's Joseph that was mistreated, hated, spoken badly about, ridiculed, but yet here he is breaking down toward the very people who had offended him so greatly and so deeply. You can just see the love that Joseph has and now for the first time he identifies himself and his brothers see that that's him. What an amazing day it must have been. You know, when you show up at a reunion and you thought somebody in your family was long past and all of a sudden they're at the reunion eating potato chips and drinking a Pepsi, you're like, what are you doing here? I thought you were dead at 10 years ago. But well, how'd you get here? And it's Joseph. And then, I mean, I, they, they're stunned. They're absolutely stunned. They had already told the, their father that, yeah, that poor special son of yours, Joseph, he, he died. Yeah, the ferocious wolves ate him up. Remember, they took that ornament or coat and they put blood on it and they gave it back to the father and said, this is all that remains of your dear precious son, Joseph. And now, and now he reveals himself. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. And then he quickly says, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. I mean, I, can you just imagine it in your head? What did Joseph do? Did he say, hey, look in my eyes, feel, feel my cheeks. Look at how much I look like you. I am your brother, Joseph. What an emotional time this must have been. And they were speechless. They were absolutely, they were stunned. Stunned silence. I can't believe what's happening. And Joseph wants to know how his father is doing because he had a special relationship with his father. And, and Joseph's identifying himself had to be such a powerful moment. But now watch this. Joseph offers forgiveness to his brothers for what they did. Let's see. Tony, will you read out for us? <clears throat> and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land. 
and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler, and ruler of Egypt. So now here's Joseph. He's reassuring his brothers. And he puts a God perspective, a God twist, a God spin on what they did to him in his explanation. And he says, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. What is Joseph in actuality doing for his brothers in this sentence? What is he doing for them? He's letting them off the hook. He's saying, yeah, I, I, I know that you, you meant to hurt me. You meant, you meant to hurt me. You tried to do me in. But I am telling you with my words and my actions that I'm letting you off the hook. And I'm letting you go. He's basically saying he's the, he is the one offended. And he's saying back to them, don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. In other words, forgive yourself. I'm giving you permission to forgive yourself. Now, that's a beautiful concept because when we confess our sins to God and we lay it all out in truth and honesty, do you know what God does for us in his words to us? He offers that forgiveness and he says, hey, don't be angry. Don't beat yourself up. It's over. I forgive you. Don't bring it up anymore. <laughs> Quit bringing it up. I forgive you. Do, do not be distressed. Your sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. Your sins I will remember no more. Don't talk to me about what you did two years ago. Again, I forgive you. Forgive yourself. Now, you're, the person that offended you at some point in your life may never say to you, I forgive you. They may never say that. But if you can't do anything about it, you can't do anything about it. It doesn't mean you can't forgive yourself. It doesn't mean you can't learn from what happened to you, the injustice or the betrayal or the rejection or the hurt. And you can forgive them whether they forgive you back or not. It doesn't make any difference. We don't have to wait for someone to forgive us for us to forgive them, right? Because if we had to, we'd have a whole bunch of undone business out there because there may be several people in your life that will never forgive you or never say to you, you know, I was wrong and I forgive you. Joseph is letting them off the hook and he says, brothers, let it go. No guilt, no shame, no retribution. I'm offering you forgiveness. It's a beautiful thing. And then Joseph takes it a step further and he puts it into God language. And he says this, you intended to harm me. So it wasn't like Joseph was stupid or ignorant or in denial. He knew exactly why his brothers threw him in the pit. They wanted to hurt him. And then he takes that, that truth and he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Because all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord and live according to his purpose. And Joseph said, you tried to hurt me, but, but God was in it. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Joseph dwelt in the present moment. The, the saving of many lives. He's telling his brothers, because you tried to harm me, God intended it for good. And the reason you're getting grain today, and the reason you're getting food in this famine, and the reason why your lives are being protected is because... God intended it for good. See, people can't hurt you. Really. They can't hurt you. Because whatever is done to you, God will turn it into good. When you belong to Him. If you'll trust Him and you'll, and you'll let Him do that, He'll take every negative in your life and turn it into a positive. Every single one of them. If we will let Him. And that's awesome. You intended to harm me, Joseph said. But God had intended it for you. And if you hadn't done that, remember I told you about Talisa saying, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Joseph said, if you hadn't thrown me in the pit, I wouldn't be able to help you today. Your life wouldn't be saved right now because another governor of Egypt might not be as 
as prone to help you as I am. So here it is. Joseph focused on God's plan instead of his own pain. Think of that. Everybody read that with me. Joseph focused on God's plan instead of his own pain. Ah, that's the key. Focus on what God is doing in your life today, not the pain of yesterday. Joseph focused on the blessings of the present moment instead of the rejection of his past. Joseph was able to take the positive, important blessings of his life and live in the moment of today rather than dwell dwelling and reliving and replaying all the hurts of the past. Because replaying and reliving the rejections and the pains of the past will keep us in a cycle of defeat. The only cure to overcome the hurts of the past is to recount the positive, important blessings of your life in the moment. That's where we have to live. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press on toward the goal of winning the mark in Christ Jesus. So we focus on who you are today, not who you were yesterday. We focus on the blessings of your life today, not the pain of yesterday. We focus on where you're going because the past doesn't define you. Jesus and what he's doing in our life today is what defines us and where we're going. Not what somebody has done to me or what I've even done to myself. Joseph focused on God's goodness instead of his brother's hatred for him. Crystal's doing this gratitude thing. Tell us how that last statement fits into that for you. She said, you're looking at all the blessings instead of the crappy things that happened. And my wife is 21, 21 pages into writing a 30-day devotional on gratitude. She has 10 more to go, and then she's going to have a new book. What's it called? Attitude. No, gratitude is the new attitude. Gratitude is the new attitude. A 30-day devotional with scriptures and stories about me, her husband. No, they, they, I, I only made like one or two pages, I think, of that thing. But you know, I tell you what, focusing on the blessings of today will change your life. Focusing on the goodness of today will put everything in perspective and cause the rejections of your past to just fade away. Maybe not overnight, but little by little, the more discipline you have. And really, you know what? There's no time to be negative. And you don't help a single person by being negative. Not one. So if you're negative, stop it. Not even yourself. Yeah. That's right. You're not helping anybody by being negative. Not one person. And if you keep it up, you'll find that you won't have people that want to even talk to you or hang out with you, except other negative people. And that's not healthy. The world is needing positive, healthy people who know the goodness of God and believe in the goodness of God did you have something, Gino, you're going to share? Oh, I was just thinking about the gratitude. The Lord comes in my time and says, until you see what I've done, you can't see what I can do. Yeah. Be amazing what he's done. Amen. <laughs> until you see what I've done, you can't see what I'm doing, what I will do. Okay, good. So this is, this is, where, we, this is where we have to live. Negativity will lead to depression. Positivity will lead to optimism, growth, goodness health, so many things. And then finally, the story ends up like this. Danny, can you read that one for us, please? The next verse? Yeah, Joseph wants to bless and provide for his family. Okay. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord to his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household, otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to us will become destitute. All right. 
So here's Joseph. He, this isn't just mouth. This isn't just words. He's not just saying, oh, I forgive you. He's backing it up with his actions. And he's saying, not only do I forgive you, don't hold it against yourself, but I'm going to provide for you. And his actions backed up his words. And he said, I, there's some more famine that's going to happen. Bring down our father. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, a, a prosperous, fruitful land, Goshen. You shall live in the region, you, your children, your grandchildren, and all you have. I will provide for you there, Joseph says. And so he's backing up his promise of forgiveness to them. What a beautiful... I mean, these, these brothers went from feeling depressed, distressed, angry, guilty, shameful, to now being promised a great life, being taken care of by the governor of the country, the one who has the, the purse strings to the grain of the land. What, what an awesome thing. And the, and the happy ending to this reunion <coughs> goes like this. Mario, will you read that for us? You can see for yourselves and soak in my brother Benjamin. That is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen. Bring, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. What an awesome ending. Joseph is reminded him again. Hey, this is really, this is me, your brother, telling you this. I have the responsibility and the power to make this promise happen that I just shared with you. Bring my father down quickly. We're going to live happily ever after. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. So I want you to think back in your life at any pitfall that you've had, a rejection, a betrayal, an injustice done against you, a painful time in your life, and though God didn't necessarily want that to happen, He wants to use that in your life to bring about blessing and goodness and love and a new beginning and an optimistic spirit. And He will. He will. If you will choose the Christ perspective that Joseph teaches us so well here. There's no reason why we can't live here, here, resulting in a life of joy and peace. It's the only way to live, you know? And as long as we have peace in our heart and joy in our soul and purpose for which we live, does anything else really matter? I mean, really? Well, chickens matter because you got to feed them and they're a pain in the butt. But very, things really take on a completely different perspective when it is well with our soul. Because that's the main thing. You can have everything in the world, a great job, a 3,000 square foot house, or a new condo, townhouse, doesn't matter. You can have everything, you can have a brand new Lexus. But if we don't have, if we don't have peace and forgiveness, we don't, we don't have, we don't have what God wants us to have so that we can live a joyful life. And that's why we come to church is to once again say, yep, yeah, I want that. That's where I want to live. And guess what? You get to inspire other people with this message. You get to say, man, wouldn't it be nice to have your sins forgiven? Wouldn't it be nice to open up your heart and let God help you forgive somebody that's hurt you? And, and, so the, and wouldn't it be nice to just forgive yourself? That's the, that's the message of the gospel. That's the hope we have in Him. And that's what I want us to take with us today. So we all have our communion in front of us, except for me.